how can I see my preptan asad? Gok yam roti pot kabat mong. Dog chitin pum roj ko chitin king song. Tai bat the mong mong smart jumpa. I love you, man. You just may see him rip. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Ewan Gray, uh, and uh, it is my pleasure to be here inside your studio, especially in your home near uh, Atria Pagoda yeah. in uh, Siem Reap City. Sir. Uh, sir, you are um, a musician, you are a teacher, you are a coach, especially in music. You have taught many students uh, in Phnom Penh, and now you move to uh, to to seem real, to maybe to pursue, you know, a new, a new, you know, form of, uh, let's say, uh, educating young people or mm -hmm. uh, in, in music. Uh, sir, my first question to you is that you are an Australian, okay? And you have been in Cambodia for more than 10 years and you have uh, created this uh, establishment, which is uh, very amazing for many Cambodian people when they see it. So why, sir? Why why do you come to Cambodia and, and create such thing like this, sir? Yeah, well, I I, I met a Cambodian is the simple answer. Uh, mm. My my wife is my now wife is Cambodian. She was born in Batamong, and she grew up partly in Australia. So I met her in Australia, and we fell in love and visited Cambodia. Mm. And eventually, after a few trips, we decided to try and live here. And then we've been here for yeah, 12 years now. So I had heard about Cambodia uh, once my stepsister visited here oh, a long time ago hello. and she showed me pictures of the temples. And I, I was fascinated. I couldn't believe it. It felt like a fairy tale, you know. But, uh, and then I forgot about that. So eventually I ended up seeing the temples and it was real. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Cambodia has been a, a, a dream for me. I hadn't did not expect to live here and pretty much since the day I arrived uh, I've been working and and playing music with young people. Mm. Almost but the first time the you've, you've been to Cambodia was not Siem Reap, was Phnom Penh. Uh, the first time I, I came I went to both Phnom Penh and mm. Siem Reap, yeah, and, and uh, but as a tourist you have a different experience, you know, you, 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 you experience in a different ways you you meet people but you meet hotel staff and you meet hospitality staff when you live here you start to meet just regular people and mm. start to work um, feel really integrated into the culture very welcome actually which was which was beautiful so when you first come here sir, like you begin the music career like right away or you know do you let's say ah, oh, you want to do something at, uh, first and then later on you say that oh so maybe the music career is quite uh, an interesting uh, for mm. Cambodian or is there yeah well I was a musician in in Australia I had a band for 10 years or something mm -hmm. and when I decided to live here I, I brought my saxophone and I brought my guitar and I stayed in a hotel one night and the manager of the hotel saw my guitar and mm. said do you want to play tonight and I said oh, I don't really play you know I just yeah. jam a little bit I'm, I'm really a sax player and then she said oh no I'll invite my friends over and we'll play and you know so she invited her friends over and they had a lot of young kids and we started I started I played and all the kids joy I started teaching the kids and so from day one, I was already uh, working uh, with, with people, music, yeah, uh, yeah, which I wasn't expecting. The next week I was playing in bars and, and then the real transition for me was uh, when I met uh, a lady named Carrie Herbert. She is uh, from Wales. She was living in Cambodia and she's a musician, uh, but she's also an arts therapist. So we got talking and we both had this really strong interest in how songwriting can uh, help people express their feelings. And we thought, w why don't we try and do a project? We know we can invite some young people in. We can teach them about songwriting. We can record their songs and we'll just see what happens, you know. And this program we started, we got uh, uh, 12 young Cambodians mm. in. 
and this was uh, called Song Kites. I don't know if you heard about yeah, this. Yeah, I heard yeah. about it. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, it, to our surprise, like we were expecting to just uh, learn some learn some things and maybe help some people on their personal journeys. But what, what one thing that happened was that a lot of the songs we produced got really famous. Mm. Um, songs like Baby I'm Sorry by Jimmy Kiss, Home for Dinner by Nicky Nicky and others. We were not expecting this. And what we realized was that when we were doing this program, it was at the time in Cambodia where there was this resurgence of original music. Mm. A whole generation wanted to create what, what they want to create by themselves. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, we were just swept up into that uh, movement, I guess. And I, I met so many young people and, and the skills I, I had was able to be helpful to them at that time. And actually, I wasn't a producer before I came to Cambodia. I just fell into it. People wanted it. They, you know, they wanted songs produced, and I said, "Well, I can, I can do that. I, I know how to do it. I just, I'm not a professional, but I'll try it." And of course, the songs got famous, and <laughs> I decided, "Well, especially Ani song, yeah." Oh well, that's that's <laughs> later on when I yeah, started yeah. to do my own uh, music. Yeah, so that's, uh, I guess, after a while of working with producing songs in Khmer, I started to get a, a strong understanding of the language, not necessarily all the meaning of everything, but the sound of it yeah. and, and the way that the words work in song, not just in speaking, but in mm, song, in which is song, quite like different. You know, it involves emotion and stuff like that. Yeah. With emotion and the different ways that people extend vowels and, you know, it's, it was, I was editing vocals like for hours and hours same word over and over again. So I was learning the, the way to pronounce by editing Khmer music. Yes, sir. Uh, well, uh, but, you know, in, in, in specific, I mean, specifically when you talk about, you know, the song Ani, mm -hmm. it's in Khmer. Yeah. And uh, I, I know that, you know, sometimes, you know, Westerners, uh, you know, the way they, they pronounce between their own language and Khmer can be a bit uh, difficult. Even mm. us, when we pronounce word, you know, in English, we also feel difficult in doing so. Yeah. And how, how do you learn to, to, you know, to, to speak Khmer, even, you know, more difficult to sing in Khmer, like how, how difficult it is and how did you train for it? Yeah, well, well I, I guess I developed the ear for it, but mm. to do it myself, I, I was already in a community of people that were singers, Khmer singers. So I would ask them, I would study it by myself. At, when I learned Ani, I didn't read, but later I learned to read, which was very, very helpful in pronunciation. But I had, uh, I had people I was working with already, students and also professionals. So I would say, is this, is this right? You know, and, and can you tell me how to do this? And then when I recorded it, um, often I would have someone there working as a producer for me to help me you know yeah, but it was difficult very difficult for me and when i listened to um, if people haven't seen it i just sang it live on on face on facebook uh, uploaded a video yeah, yeah, I saw. <laughs> and a lot of people watched it and now i listen to that i can hear my mistakes like i can hear mm. things i don't do right and i've probably sung that song a thousand times now every every gig I do which, which so it took you like a thousand tries in order for for to, to get a, like a desired you know <laughs> amount of uh, you know satisfaction well I haven't got it right yet I mm. think uh, <laughs> and I've sung it maybe a thousand times but it's it's endless journey you know it's endless journey to get these these right and like now I'm learning a song jump by Simri because I moved mm. to Simri I learned this song and you know I, I I send it to my friends. I sent it to my friend since it's such a talent, since it's someone's granddaughter. I've been doing a lot of work with her as a producer and a, and a coach. And she said, oh, it's great, but uh, you got three words wrong. And these are the words mm. and you pronounce it like this. And so they, I get help. I'm very lucky to be around people that help me. Mm. Dog chit and pomroid, quite good and king song. 
มันบอกเลยเออ why why you develop a love toward Khmer you know like old music like 60s music because you know for some Cambodian people I might say ah oh, that seems a bit old you know out of date but for you you kind of like feel in love with it like why yeah well I mean since this mod in particular is is just a, such an amazing artist he's a great singer mm. and he's got so many different Styles and creativity. Uh, he's a, an inspiration. If he was Cambodian, if he was French, if he was—it doesn't matter where he's from. He's amazing, you know. So when you find someone amazing, you want to learn from them. Mm. So there's that. Also, there's just the story of Cambodian music. You know, it's—it's. It's, uh, I'm involved with modern music now. I produce songs for some artists that are working now, and I love that. But also. The story of the the music scene in the 60s is such an amazing But story. But at the same time, the melody, you know, yeah. the rhythm, it's also something that you know you love it also. Yeah. Well, my yeah. my background is in jazz music, mm. and when you learn jazz, you have to learn uh, a lot of uh, like interesting and 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 developed ways of uh, uh, chords and and harmonies, which Uh, in the 60s, they were very aware of. Mm. Now it's different, you know. Now some songs are very, very complex and interesting. Some songs are very simple. It doesn't mean they're good or bad, but uh, I'm just have that, fi that feeling. Like, yeah, it, there's it a kicks you. Yeah, there's a feeling there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, Bong, like uh, for the last decade that you stay in Cambodia, like how many songs have you worked on or have you produced? Like okay, I mean in in the music industry, like okay, a creator, producer, director, it seems a bit like they they overlap in 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 the nature of their work. Yeah. So like, can you tell me like okay, what what you have done so far? Like, yeah. Well, I I mean I I I haven't counted the songs, <laughs> but but maybe a hundred maybe a hundred songs I've helped other people produce, mm. and I have my own songs as well. So um. Uh, Yeah, you mentioned about roles overlapping. Yeah, yeah. Like my my approach is quite uh, holistic. There's, uh, you know, in in the '60s there was five people working in the studio. You know, mm, producer, okay. um, engineer, uh, you know, musicians, singer. Now you kind of have to do everything by yourself often. So that's one side of it. I I. Often work alone with an artist and do everything with them, but my approach is actually not just let's record the song and get out of here. My approach is more like how can I, how can I help you achieve the things you want to achieve? Maybe the way you sing or the style or something even emotional. I've got this song and it's about my mother and I don't know how to express it. Well, I can maybe help you express that. Mm. I like to take. My like producing into the into the realm of uh, coaching because I I think it's hard being an artist and artists want to grow and uh, they're often looking for advice and looking for help and I love to d I love to help so my style is to help them do that so I'm not interested in making songs quickly. And, and making thousands of songs, I'm interested in making good songs mm. and songs that help people achieve something in their career or personally. So basically, what you mean is that a song is not just something like you can create, you know, and churn out like in a specific interval. No, it has to be like inspired. And but but how you do? How do you manage that? So like for example. So maybe you create like a good song once in a year or once in two years, something like that. Ah, oh, it, it can be very different. Yeah, some some songs happen very quickly, and some songs take a long time. Um, mm, yeah. uh, and it's up, up to the artist too. You know, I, I work. I mentioned since as such a we we did um, one song, and it took her a year to write it because it was very personal to her. Mm. You know, and uh, and that's okay. We we just we just wait for that to happen. Some songs happen in one session. You know, so it you you just have to approach it with a sense of openness. Maybe this will be quick. Maybe this will take its time. What are we focusing on? Making a a good song, because when people really feel uh, feel the song that they're writing or singing, 
the audience feels it too, you know. And so if they're interested in people listening to it, the success of a song, often you never know. But sometimes it's because they feel it, the artist feels it, the producer feels it, the audience will feel it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. And also, sir, but for example, like for the last 10 years that you come, um, working here in Cambodia, uh, what are the challenges? Sir? Because you said you created Song Kite, maybe mm -hmm. uh, one of the school in, in, in Phnom Penh that teaches mm -hmm. young students how to, how to work on music. So what are the challenges that you, you face along the way, sir, for example? Yeah, well, I should mention also I was the music director of the Sound Initiative later on, which was, uh, which was uh, a, like a technical school for teaching people about songwriting, music production, performance, music business. So um, that, that's been the later half of my career here working with students. But the challenges, I mean, uh, well, for people that want to get into music, it's not a career that is associated with money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's can be a, a dilemma for yeah. some people. Yeah, yeah. So them and also their families can resist a music career, and and I understand why. You know, so people often want to do music, and it's not the wishes of their parents, for example, mm. and they struggle with that. That's hard, and I understand that because except for some big artists, no one is really making a lot of money in, in, in music around the world, not just in Cambodia. It's a, it's a very difficult industry. So that's a big challenge for people and they have to find ways to keep their passion alive for music and still, you know, fulfill their responsibilities to their family, to their, um, you know, to pay their bills. So it's this always this thing is music is my passion, but can it be my career? Because you need finance to in order to sustain yeah. what you are doing forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and the industry is changing here and there's some opportunities, but still worldwide music is, is going down. So it, it's very hard, uh, e even if the industry grows in a really positive way here for most people that want to do music. It, they, they will never be able to earn enough money, which is sad. Yes, but at the same time in Cambodia, let's say for the past, you know, three, four, five years, there is what, uh, let's say, a trend in, mm -hmm. you know, uh, content, let, let's say, like solo music, mu musician, something like that. Mm. And they all create their own song, you know, their own, their own uh, melody. And uh, it's quite um, uh, an era in, in Cambodia right now because yeah. uh, many people are, are, are flocking to listen to their you know own musician in mm -hmm. for I mean of their own country yeah so uh, from your point of view sir like you are a, an expert in music also <laughs> how, how do you view that sir like is it something that is good to move forward and maybe more opportunity to you f to work in Cambodia ah uh, well I think what's happened in the last three to five years yeah, yeah. you mentioned is uh, it's been easier to make your own music I mm. at home. Um, equipment's become more cheaper. available and cheaper. And people have had a lot of role models now that mm. they know in Cambodia that make their own music. And they and have learned... But people have always been making their own music. It's not like it, 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 it wasn't happening. But more and more people are finding they're able to do it. So now if you have a laptop and a microphone... Some you can keyboard. make your own music. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so people are now, they just, they've just learnt, you know, and from mm -hmm. YouTube, from, from education, from their role models, they've, they've learned how to do it. And yeah, it's amazing because if you do it yourself, the advantages are y y it's cheaper because you're not paying someone to make it for you. It's, you have a chance to really do things the way you want to do it. So you can have a real pure uh, um, process. Undisturbed, you know, environment. Exactly, yeah. And, but the disadvantages is you're on your own. It, you, you, mm. it, maybe it would be better if someone could help you, you know, someone that's better at guitar, yeah, you can play it, but someone that's better could help you or give you a better mix and master, someone could help you. So for me, it doesn't matter what 
but what uh, quality the the music is technically it's more about the feeling so mm. like like if if someone just sings a song with a guitar on an iPhone blah 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 and it feels a million people will watch that you know you can spend ten thousand dollars making a song and it sounds amazing technically no feeling no one will be interested so it's more about the story of the song and your feeling in the song Yes, sir. So you, you've been talking a lot about feeling, and at the same time, you know, because questions just keep popping from my head. <laughs> um, there's a Khmer proverb saying that if the culture dies, the nation dies. Mm. So you know, when when you when you talk about song, you know, song sometimes really represent the spirit of the nation. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, every country have their own song, their own spirit for their own nation. Mm -hmm. And for you, sir, like, do you really do you really think like that is like a strong case? You know, that song really reinforced the nation's spirit and you know made people, you know, feel good about their their, their own motherland. I, I I that's what people tell me. Yeah, I mean, I've from the start, I've 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 always heard Khmer musicians and artists say they're really proud of their culture. And they want to express that by by being successful in their music, and I they don't always mean traditional Khmer music or since it's somewhat music. They just mean their own music that they want to mm. prove to themselves and to the world that they can do it and do it their own way. That's what I hear. My perception is different. I'm, I'm an outsider. It's difficult for me to talk about that, but I understand. That music plays a big role in in culture, but that also culture grows. Culture is not a fixed thing. Uh, culture uh, changes over time, and music changes over time. Sometimes the music changes the culture. Um, hip hop here is the biggest thing, right? It it, it was never a Khmer style, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It came from America. Um, but hip hop is in Australia. It's in the UK. It's everywhere. It it, it adapts to the culture. So mm -hmm. now we have amazing Khmer hip hop, which feels very Cambodian, but it's uh, still a root somewhere else. You know, yeah, yeah, from. and it's and it's a way of 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 the culture here incorporating that that music and e expressing it uh, within the Khmer culture. And that was happening in the 60s too, you know, like it's not a new thing uh, in the in the 60s. A lot of that development was because of the influence from outside. And um, and that's that's happened all around the world. I'm from Australia. Yeah. Australia was uh, colonized only 220 years ago, 240 years ago or something. And uh, everything we know in Australia has come from another country, really, mm. you know. And so my attitude towards culture is because I was brought up in a country that has has a culture that goes back 40,000 years with the Aboriginal people but the 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 let's say the Western culture the Western history of Australia is very new you know so when we think about music we think oh this is American music it's it's British music it's not, not Australian it's, music no. yeah eventually <laughs> yeah. we think yeah. yeah this is Australian music this song yeah, yeah. you know um, mm. like one of the most f famous songs that everyone sings at weddings you know it's just a cover someone did of, of an American song but we think oh that's our Australian guy singing we love that song and we feel proud of our yeah. country this it's a it's a interesting dynamic of culture and, and art uh, yes Bong, like uh, you talk about the emotion of the music, stuff like that, and uh, sometimes it can be a, a bit abstract. Mm -hmm. But you know, like for example, when you play your music on stage or maybe in the studio, I mean, do you notice that oh, your music is like you know going deeper into the person by looking that at their eyes, mm -hmm. their facial expression? Like, do you do you know? I mean, do you get that sense a lot? Mm, that's a good question. Um, yes. Uh, when, when you play, like, I play a lot of different things, a lot of different instruments, saxophone, guitar, I sing, and I play jazz, I play pop, I play lots of different things. Mm, so yeah. 
my when I play, I I really play for the people. I know a lot of musicians that play for themselves. And they play just because they want it, want it to play well. But someone in the band needs to look after the audience, and often mm. it's the person singing. You know, so when I sing, I'm I'm taking care of to see and, and watch and listen for the the response of the audience. And sometimes you have to push them to be response, to, to get a response. You know, how how do you them. push them? Oh, talk well, to them. you can talk to them, yep, and you can like get them engaged, or you can just use your presence to, uh, to engage mm. them. Like if I talk to you like this, yeah. it stops you know, interaction, yeah. you become uninterested. If I talk to you like this, <laughs> it's quite a lot, right? You yeah. feel, oh, <laughs> you become engaged. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so you can use your presence. Body posture. Body posture, yeah. But also the music, you know, you can play in a way that mm. brings emotion to people, not just you can really engage them with music and you know it it depends uh sometimes you play in a restaurant people are eating sometimes mm. you play at a big concert so many variables so and not you, just one thing that fits yeah, all no no yeah and you, the thing with jazz is just what i play a lot is you can change very quickly mm. you know you can just go quiet, go loud, fast, slow, you can adapt. And being flexible, you can see uh, these people, they're actually having a nice time eating. They don't want to be engaged. We just bring it in and then when they, they start Ambient to be- Ambient sound, yeah. Yeah, when they start to be interested, you can open up. So mm. there's, a, there's a big, there's a, uh, an interaction between what you play and how you uh, engage with the audience. And when both are working really well, it's amazing. That's what you search for. You want to engage with people. Right, and that's what we're always chasing. <laughs> yes, more. And at the same time, I mean, here near Wat Atwil, you know, mm. one of the ancient pagoda and mm. temple in Cambodia, of course. Uh, I mean, like, frankly speaking, you know, like some Cambodian, they want to move to Australia, you know, because of the skyscrapers, because of the modernity of life you know, like a, you know, westernized lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But Bong, for you as an Australian, it, it seems that you're doing the opposite. You know, you come to Cambodia, you <laughs> stay at the countryside, you know, cows, chicken, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know the river. Why, why do you choose, you know, the opposite of life uh, when compared to the previous mentioning Bong? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm just fascinated by uh, this country uh, and I have a very strong connection through my wife and her mother who I live with. Uh, I, I feel connected to Cambodia through them and I feel now connected to Cambodia through the, the work that I do and, and, the, and in music. And uh, you know, you can live a, a, any kind of life in Australia, like mm. you could live a very simple country life, you could live a sky sky skyscraper life kind in of the life, city. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm, I feel very lucky that I have a choice to live here. It, it's or Australia. That's that's an extremely lucky position to be in, and I still have family in Australia, so I, I'm able still to visit there and, and, and live there if I want. But, uh, you know, honestly, Phnom Penh was uh, getting a bit busy and a bit <laughs> crazy, right? Yeah. skyscraper -y. <laughs> So uh, we decided to move to Siem Reap where it's more peaceful and more green and uh, more sort of connected to yeah. culture. and yeah. More yeah. relaxing in, in general terms. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and it's amazing. I mean, it's f what Atwia is f maybe 500 meters away. And, uh, you know, that's just so much tradition right here in in this place you know and um, i'm actually working on a project in uh in angkor as a as a documentarian and a, and a writer which is not a music project so i'm very engaged in the history and the and the uh the sort of working with people as they uh, present um, the history to other people you know so that's i feel very connected to siem reap now not just Cambodia. 
And my last question, Bong, like, do you plan to make like an, a school or maybe an institution that you teach, you know, student to young people in Cambodia? <laughs> oh, sorry, in, in Siem Reap, maybe in the future? I, I'm open to that. I, I have no, no plans. Uh, right now, I, I just uh, f focus on uh, creating uh, my space and mm -hmm. my community in Siem Reap. Of course, I still have a lot of connections in Phnom Penh and with my old school, the Sound Initiative. Um, there are opportunities to develop things. Um, I have no specific plans. I haven't met many musicians yet in Siem Reap, um, a few already, but not, not many. So my plan now is to get to know the community and listen to them and see what they want and respond to that. Um, if, there's a, if there's a need and a desire for music education or production in the way that I teach, then there's, uh, um, I love that. I love that. If there's, if there's no, no demand for that, I will follow what people <laughs> want, you know? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, thank you for the interview for today, Bong, and uh, it's a nice place to be here in a very, very uh, echoless studio. <laughs> and <laughs> the design is very great, Bong, yeah. So, thank you, thank you Bong, for the interview. Yeah. ไอ้ลาบานยูจมไปซีมรีบกรุ๊มจรุจรีปูเป่งอารามตรงบองบ้านสไปปีเรื่องสนายหาลาบกาจำปาอารีมกรีมกรมร้อยปรุยร้อย